record. Okay. Hello, Ryan. Welcome back to the podcast. Hello, Mr. Cecil. How are you? I am good. Thank you, Mr. Thwaites. I didn't realize we were starting with formalities. Oh, it's formality. It's a new year. It's a new year. Yeah. And uh, our, new our year. first chat TAP for the season. Yeah. It's going to be a good one. I'm it excited, is, it is going to be a good one. And you've done the legwork here. So thank oh, you for that. Yeah. You've, no you've worries. invited this guest. Yeah. <laughs> Every now and then I'll <laughs> stumble upon one. Uh, yeah. No, I'm excited. Well, let's jump into the guessing game, and because you've brought the guests, I don't, I don't know where they're from. So that's right. Is, yeah. Okay. So, man, how do I do this? All right. So <laughs> I've selected three very, very specific, very careful questions. All right. So today we're looking for a city. Okay. Okay. All right. All right. You may you. I reckon you'll get this. Question three. I gave you a little bit of a softball. I think because you're a sport guy. So all right. Okay. So question number one. This city experienced a major population boom in the 1850s due to a gold rush, making it one of the world's largest cities at the time. 1850s gold rush. Uh, <laughs> what popped to my mind is just those cartoon gold rush. <laughs> you know, the, <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> pushing the gold mines. And... Yeah, man. And the, those those seesaw type things, I don't know the name right name for yeah, them. the little carts that the go carts. along with the yeah yeah yeah. yeah. That, that's what jumped to mind. <laughs> that's, that's gold rush times, man. It, it doesn't help me with a city. <laughs> no, uh, it doesn't. And and I don't know. I feel like it's going to be in the US, and mm -hmm. I don't know. I'm not as familiar with the US as you are. I'm going to say. Dallas in Texas. That's a fair guess, but no. Okay. I'm not going to tell you if it was a good guess. It was a fair guess. <laughs> <Okay>. Thank, you. <laughs> Thank you. All right, question two. This city is renowned for having the highest number of restaurants and cafes per number of people than any other city in the world. That doesn't help me at all. <laughs> Gold Rush. Cities, cafes, uh, sorry, city with lots of cafes and restaurants. Oh, man, it has to be a big city then. Yes, I'll give you that. Uh, my default would be New York City because it's so big, but I just, I don't think that fits in with the gold rush situation. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Gets cold in New York City. I don't it know does. if that's a... Is that a gold thing? <laughs> you know, it's, no, oh, I guess no. in Canada they have gold. Yeah. yeah. Do they? Um, yeah. I'm still thinking warm, hot. So maybe I'm going to go over to the other side and say Los Angeles. No. Okay. Uh, all right. So this third question may uh, may flip you around a little bit. All right. This city has the largest cricket ground by capacity, known for hosting major sporting events, but not limited to cricket. What? Yeah. In, not in America anymore. Oh, we're not in America anymore. <laughs> oh, man. Gold Rush? Cafes and restaurants? Oh, we have to be in Melbourne. It's Melbourne. Well done, man. Ah, oh, nice. There that was go. that was really hard. I I have to give you credit <laughs> for the times that I've given you really hard clues. Hitting in the hot seat. Sorry, let me say that again. Sitting in the hot seat is really tough when you have <laughs> no idea where we are. You're trying to. I try not to use the time zone as a bit of a clue, but you can't help oh, it. You have to. Yeah, you yeah, have. You to. have. You have to. Yeah. Um, that was tough, man. That was that was really tough. Thank you for the last one. That that really no. helped. I mean, the no, quicker. That yeah, that was easy for me. No, it's funny because I, I knew you would be in, in America probably for the first one at least, maybe the second one. And I was like, man, this third one will bring you back to Australia and maybe get it for you. So Yeah, as soon as you said cricket and then the cafes, rest, I was like, oh, it has to be. Yeah, it's bloody cafes. Yeah. Bloody the cricket. MCG, the Melbourne Cricket Ground Melbourne for cricket. our international listeners. 100,000 seating capacity. Yeah. Have, you, have you have you been to the MCG? No, I haven't. Have you? I, I haven't either. I really want to see an AFL game there. I, I I mean, obviously the grand final would be amazing, but just the atmosphere with a hundred thousand people 
AFL would be awesome. Yeah, hell yeah. I just hate AFL and cricket, so. Yeah, <laughs> yeah so you, <laughs> no plans anytime soon. No. Nah. <laughs> so, mate, tell us about our guest. Mate, our guest. Oh, geez, put me on the spot. Uh, <laughs> Did you forget that you're hosting this? <laughs> no, I'm just like underprepared. Um, yeah, mate, so our guest today uh, actually lives in New York City, but she was born in Melbourne, so that's why I stitched you up there. Ah, uh, so I was right with yeah, New York City yeah, to, yeah, to a degree, and, yeah. Um, yeah, I'm pretty sure she lives in New York. Well, that's that's based on our conversation. So our guest today is Rabina Corton. I think it's Corton, uh, and she is a Buddhist nun, and uh, she lives in New York City, and uh, she's been practicing as a Buddhist nun for like 45 years, uh, and just with all of the different guests we've been having on chat CAP, it made sense to get another perspective on death and grief. And uh, yeah, why not come at it from a Buddhist angle? And um, the more I've read about Rabina, the more of a rock star I'm seeing that she is and um, actually is, man, she has quite quite the body of work and different things she's done. I'm just, yeah, I'm really excited to talk to her. So, Excellent. Yeah. So first, first episode of Chat TAP for the season. So just a refresher for those, uh, Chat TAP is chat to a professional or some sort of professional in the grief space. So um, yeah, last year we had a grief counsellor. Uh, who else do we have, Ryan? We had uh, a death doula. And uh, yeah, we fell off the wagon a little bit with Chat TAP. So but we're on a mission this year to have at least one uh, per month. Hopefully, that's the plan anyway. And uh, really looking forward to this conversation because I haven't ever spoken to a Buddhist nun about. <laughs> Me I mean, full stop. But also uh, totally. about their work in the grief space. So this is going to be a really cool chat. So uh, let's jump into our conversation with Rubina. Okay. Okay. Well, thank you, Rubina, for joining us on the. Oh, tell me what, the... where were your names, Ryan and Mark? Okay, yes, Ryan, that's Mark. it. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Okay, yeah. I'll intrigue. Thank you, Rubina, for joining us officially on the Remembering Them podcast, all the way over yeah. from New York City. Happy to be here. Happy to be here, Mark. But minus the New York accent, because as Definitely in the introduction, New York accent. yeah, you're, yeah, you're originally from from <laughs> Melbourne, so. Yep. Tell us about that uh, move. How long have you been there? And also, if you can add one thing that you love about New York City, that if we, I, I've been there before. I think, Ryan, have you been to New York City before? Yeah. If we were to come back over or Aussies visiting New York City, apart from yeah. the, the touristy things, what what do they need to do? I understand. Well, well I'll answer that question first. What's, they, they love Australian cafes in, in New York and in, in America, in California. They, the one just down the road, Little Rubies, they call it, and including on the menu, can you believe it, Vegemite toast and Avo toast. But people, <laughs> they call it Australian cuisine. You know, people love it and it's packed with people. People love Australian coffee. There's cafes that are called flat white and that kind of thing. So that's interesting Ooh. about New York now. Australian cafes. Do you get food but, and, and coffees from there or no? Well, I went, I've been there several times to get to have breakfast with friends and it's always been packed. You know, you've got to book, book up in advance, you know. <laughs> so I went one day and it was okay. It was all right. I had a cup of coffee there. So the other part was Melbourne. You mean how long have I been in New York? Well, okay. I mean, okay. I've been a, okay. Yeah. Well, I'm, I've been on the road most of my life, actually. Somehow I've always just been a nomad. It's very curious, you know. And as a Buddhist, I really like that. And the last, until the pandemic, I was on the road for like 10 years nonstop, I think. I didn't have a – I just had one bag and and was going around to Buddhist centres around the world, getting these round-the-world tickets. And then the pandemic shifted things, and I was in Santa Fe in New Mexico for two years. And it was very nice there. It's kind of funny because New Mexico is fairly high, but it's actually – it's Mount Kosciuszko, apparently, which is the highest point in Australia, oh, wow. is the same height as Santa Fe, which has got nothing special. Oh. And I think Australia is the lowest country on the earth, you know, in terms of – below the seat, whatever mm. it is. Anyway, I was there for a couple of years and it's all very nice and red desert and people love Santa Fe. And I went to New York to teach and I thought, what am I doing on this within this boring, boring city, Santa Fe? So I decided, I don't know, I'm about time to settle down because I'm old. It's my birthday tomorrow. Stop it. You are not. Well, I mean, it's I am. It's your birthday I'm tomorrow? Right? No, my birthday tomorrow. Happy birthday. Yes. I'll be I'm a Sagittarius. I'll be 79 tomorrow. So I am old, but it's all right. I, I don't mind, you know, it's a reality. But I still must think I'm 42 or something because I 
act like I'm full, <laughs> which is probably helpful. Anyway, never mind. So I, I decided to sort of, yeah, so I still teach and Zoom has changed everything. And I find it, frankly, very an advantage from the Buddhist perspective. You know, people, many people over the world don't have a Buddhist center. So now you can go on Zoom. You can go anywhere in the world. And I think I, I love it. So since that time, I've decided to teach more on Zoom instead of traveling around. But also I, my other jobs, I edit things and do other things as well. So it suits me to have a, a place to have be, to be settled. I still travel. I'm going off to London, spend time with a friend in for Christmas and things like that. So I've been here, I, be, I moved here a year ago, basically. So yeah, it's the first wow. time in my life. Well, actually, you know, when I was 23, when I first left home in 1967, and I went to live in London, in London, like you do when you're Australian, you're so excited. Yeah. And I was 23, 1967. And I got my, and I got, I think the very first time I rented a place of my own, and I haven't really since. And it was like a bed sit, a bed sitting room, which is what they call a studio now, for five pounds a week. I remember that very vividly. That was, and I went to Conrad's and bought some dishes. I think it's about the last time I did that until now. So it's a brand new experience being a house. <laughs> but I'm, I'm happy. I don't mind. If you buy dishes, you stay in port, pretty much. There you go. <laughs> yeah. That's right. <laughs> so anyway, here I am. In New I York City. It. Amazing. Well, thank, thank you for joining us all the way over from New York City. We know oh, wow. we spoke off mic that it's it completely opposite to here at the moment. Very hot in Brisbane and very cold in New York City. Tell us about your start into Buddhism. What was the oh, attraction? Medicine. I know it was probably a, a long time ago, but um, can you tell us about medicine. what mm, drew you to Buddhism? Well, I was brought up in a Catholic family in Melbourne, and I kind of joke that throughout, you know, it's sort of my phases in my life. I mean, there was I sort of following this track of always trying to find the, I mean, find the meaning of life sounds so boring, but I suppose it's a valid way to put it. We Many people are trying to work out, you know, so you call it religion, you call it philosophy, you call it politics, whatever you like. It's just, it's a bunch of viewpoints. I always want, I was looking for a viewpoint. So I was brought up a Catholic and I was in love with God and I went to mass every day and everything. But then I decided when I was 19, which is sort of the 60s, time to say goodbye, God, hello, boys. I didn't have guilt or anything. And I was always very sincere in whatever I did. I was 100%. And then I became this kind of raging hippie, then went to London and continued my raging hippie, sort of blaming all the straight people for the suffering of the world. And then I became kind of a radical lefty and demonstrating and blaming all the rich people and for, for the suffering of the world. Then I got involved in kind of black politics and all that kind of thing, blaming all the white people. And then I became a feminist. And I thought the word was feminist, you know, so I'd never heard of it before. And then I heard about radical feminists. I thought, oh, I like radical. And then I became naturally, became because I always go as far as I can, I became a radical lesbian feminist, chucked out the boys. And then I even became a radical lesbian separatist feminist. I mean, most people haven't heard of that. So it's just looking for a way to see the world. I suppose it's the only way to say it. Look, but also looking, and I know it sounds so grand, looking for freedom and truth is all I can tell you. I wanted happiness, but I never wanted happiness in the in terms of living in the same house as somebody. I was into sex and drugs and jazz, but the, the thought of living in the same bed in the same house as one person, I'd rather go to prison. So I want freedom. The feeling I have is I want to rush ahead and do exactly what I want, which can sound incredibly selfish, but also it can be, very, it can be a very good quality to not be afraid of what people think and to do what you know is the right thing. Actually, I remember, I always quote this, I, I read about some Australian nurse working in, in the UK with the dying. It's an interesting question, interesting point. And she wrote this book called The Five Greatest Regrets of the Dying. And the greatest regret was that I didn't follow my heart. I didn't do what I really wanted. I did what I thought was expected of me. So I think that's a really powerful point. And for some reason in my life, I could have been selfish. I left my mother. I left everybody behind me. But somehow it turned out to be good because I had enough, well, self-centeredness or courage, whatever you prefer, to follow what I really felt I had to do, you know. So that was – so then finally I was – I'd sort of exhausted all options of – and it's like that, really – of who to blame for the suffering of the world. And then I bumped into these Tibetans. And in fact, it was in Queensland at Chen Raising Institute in 1976. And I went and I was being, I'd been doing karate. I'd I thought I found, I thought I'd found my path. I loved martial arts. I was training six days a week. Then I broke my foot. Some kind fellow ran over my foot. And then I saw a poster at Shakahari in Melbourne. And it was for this, a particular course up at Chen Raising Institute. And that was where then I sort of finally, I was about 31 by that point, 32. And here I am all these years later. Somehow the Buddhist approach to life, I liked I liked the approach. 
it suits my mind. It gives me a framework for understanding myself and others. It gives me a framework. And there's there's a nice analogy in Buddhism that a bird needs two wings, wisdom and compassion. So the wisdom wing is where you put yourself together so that you can be then go ahead and do the compassion wing, which has helped the crazy world. You know, we live in this crazy planet together. So you've got to put yourself together first, then you can be of use to others. So that's sort of this approach suits me. And that's 46 whatever years ago. So that's here I am so far, so good. I think I'm sort of going down, not not quite, I'm not as extreme as you with jumping around with being here. I'm a little slower to do things. But I think that, <laughs> uh, I think that I, I'm sort of finding the same thing with Buddhism as well. Like I'm, I'm just starting to learn about it. And the more I'm learning about yeah. it, the more I'm thinking, this is actually what I feel. And this is, I believe That's in this. Thing, like, sure. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, I think, I mean, the thing is what's, I think it's interesting. Often sometimes people, um, who don't have a religious philosophical view will say, oh, I don't believe in anything. As mm. Sort of the assumption being that what you believe is true and everybody else is wacky, you know. But in reality, we all have a mind and we all have a way of interpreting the world. And in a sense, that's our responsibility as humans to find a way to interpret the world, interpret the suffering, interpret beings, so we can function in this crazy world and for the world to be viable, no matter how bad it is, so that we don't lose the plot and can be useful. I mean, put it in a really simple way. And that's, I think the onus is on all of us to try and find a way to to find a way to navigate the world like that it's a given that we're living here you know so i mean it happens to, yeah so it's our, i think it's our mm. job to find yeah, a way that. do you understand yeah and no i, I never looked at it really, that way yeah no i mean think about it really we've all got viewpoints and the bottom line i suppose the one thing that we'd all share whether you're a good communist or a good australian aboriginal or a good feminist i think ethics is the basis good mm -hmm. ethics you know like the christians say treat yourself treat others like you want to be treated it's such a simple way to put it good ethics seems so reasonable and the absolute basis of anything and if everything whatever you do is based in ethics then good enough you know that's great it's a good way to live your life yeah you understand speaking of viewpoints rabina what is the yeah. Buddhist view on death and the nature of life you yeah, understand well, I mean, you know, you go to different Buddhist centers, you go to a Zen center, you're going to hear one thing and you go to, a bit like the Christians, you go to a, a Southern Baptist church in one place, you go to a sort of a high Roman Catholic one, you're going to get very different vibes and very different uh, emphasis on different things. But the fundamentals are the same, I'd say. So the bottom line in Buddhism is that... Um, is 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 actually what you could say the expertise of this this person called Buddha he's not the equivalent of a creator that's the biggest difference Buddha does Buddhism doesn't assert a creator because Buddha's Buddha's view is there are billions of beings consciousnesses or minds these words are used synonymously and like ants and dogs and humans all kinds of beings and several that we can't see all kinds and we every millisecond by millisecond. We're driven by this, the Buddhists would refer to it as this natural law of karma in the simple sense that we're driven by this natural law that whatever we think and do and say is the process that produces the person we become. And that goes not just in this life, but we come into this life, Buddha would say, program, not coming from our mummy, daddy, grandma, grandpa, back to the monkeys, nor from a creator, nor from nothing. The Buddha's view would be, and all this is in the literature, and it's, a, it's this presentation of reality that consciousness goes back and back and back and everything we think and do and say programs us and produces our happiness and our suffering so we come into this life program with our own tendencies we find our way to our particular mother and father and it's sort of no accident it's come it's a sort of a natural law and then whatever we think and do and say we continues to produce who we are in the future and the bottom line is that uh Actions we do that are based on neurosis and anger and depression and jealousy and anger and all the other rubbish, which we can see in the world, programs me with misery and suffering. And it's not meant to be, it's not punishment and a reward. There's no punisher or rewarder in Buddhism. So it's 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 what I do to myself. So And then actions I do based on good ethics, as I said before, produce, turn my mind into a happy person, a happy mind, speaking really, really simply. So the idea is, you because you want to be happy yourself and you want to be useful to others, it's a no-brainer that, of course, you choose to live according to ethics because you want to be happy and you want to be useful to others. So you and then you die and you've programmed your mind and then your mind will take another rebirth. It's all covered in all the literature. It's all extensive. And that you continue. But the point is that God, there's a goal. That you don't just go randomly from life to life. But the Buddha's other, the key Buddhist view is that we've all got this, our mind has this extraordinary potential to be perfected. This word nirvana 
is not just some place like heaven. You've achieved your nirvana when you have completely cut the rubbish from the mind, completely programmed your mind with goodness and wisdom and virtue and rid the mind of all the rubbish because our minds aren't set in stone. So we've got this marvelous potential to perfect our own mind, to develop these two wings of the bird, if you like, put yourself together, become this marvelous, fully fulfilled, content person so you can be of use to others. Speaking really simply. Is, is Nirvana achievable or is it, it's always the pursuit of Nirvana? No, no, no. It's by definition achievable. It's, I yeah. mean, the Buddhist methodology is detailed descriptions of exactly how to do that. The Buddha's mm. is person who has found from his own experience um, that that's the potential of the mind. He's done the job. He says, this is my methodology over to you. You know, that's the yeah, point. Right. Interesting. That's the idea. Does that make sense? And, yeah, okay. it does. And, and so does that then continue on after death or what's right. the Buddhist view yeah, 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 on yeah sure because i mean yeah especially in the tibetan buddhist tradition where they have the esoteric teachings there are very detailed descriptions of the process of death and one of the key jobs as a tibetan buddhist is you learn to become very familiar with that process and you want to prepare for death because you are preparing for the next life so you're in charge of this process it's not a question of being punished or rewarded by anybody there's no one running the show so there's these very detailed descriptions of how to um prepare yourself for your death and living your life in the start for a start with, with trying to get beyond the fear of death and get beyond the fear of grasping onto things and realize everything's impermanent. So living life in the reality of change every second, then when you're, then when the death comes, you're ready for it because you've lived a good life. And then you're, as it goes through this process and your consciousness will then leave the body and programmed by your own past actions, take another rebirth, something like that. Well, so you preparing to paraphrase, I guess, you're preparing yourself for death by living a good life? Living your life. Yeah, I mean, basically that. I mean, I think one of the things we can see is just even just the word death gives brings so much fear, you know. First of all, in general, we don't like change. I mean, even just change, break, you know, freaks us out. So death is like the worst change possible. We can't bear the thought of not being me. I think probably the attachment, the strongest attachment we have and one of my teachers says that one of the deepest, strongest attachment at the time of death isn't to your mummy, your daddy, your, your your anything, but it, or your possessions. It's to your own very sense of self and this body. There's intense fear of losing it, you know, intense fear of not being whatever it is. So, um, so yeah, by learning to live your life in the context of impermanence, realizing things change and it's natural, then you become more relaxed about it. And then because you want to live a life of ethics and be useful, your mind won't be so freaked out at death and you'll be able to die with a happy mind, you know. And that is what helps you prepare. I mean, there's all sorts of explanations of it. Yeah. It seems so difficult to to process, I think. Like if you're not used to it, isn't it like that, you know, like this whole sense of self and, and letting go and you know, this is all natural. Yeah, it's very hard. Wow. Too, too, it's too hard. And I, yeah, I mean, yeah, yeah. Anyway, go on. Go on, ask more questions. It's good. But you know, I'm going to assume just by virtue of the time that you spent on this earth that you've had personal yeah. experiences. But what yeah. personal experience have you had where Buddhist Buddhist teachings have helped you uh, through a period of mourning? So people that you've lost. Yeah, I understand years. exactly. I understand exactly. I mean, I think yeah, I think. First of all, again, making this point that somehow what goes on in your mind, the way you frame the world, the way you understand things is really obviously the basis of how you handle something. So if I'm living my life, living in fear of losing my beloved husband, let's say, or living in fear of losing my house or my children or myself, then clearly you're not going to be happy in life. Stop criticizing. I mean, I remember one woman in a class, she said, I live in fear every day of my my husband could die. How can I handle it? So if you live like this, life is a torment, you know, because you, 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 you're, you're bumping into the reality that things are impermanent and, you, and not facing the reality is too painful. So, I mean, of course, the, the whole point of the Buddhist teachings for me isn't just to keep them in my head and be some clever person passing my Buddhist exams, you know. If it doesn't filter down and transform you as a person, then it's just intellectual nonsense, you understand? So, be, so by becoming, for me, I'm finding, becoming familiar with these ideas of karma, familiar with the ideas of impermanence from by by learning them myself studying meditating on them and then having to teach them this of course is helping me transform myself and so i mean I've, my beloved sister my oldest sister died last year you know so of course because 
the way it helped me because also I had this view of reincarnation. I wanted to help my sister. There she was unconscious. I got to Melbourne in time before they stopped the machine, you know? So, I mean, I was mainly concerned with doing prayers and practices. Actually, it was rather funny because all my other sisters, no interest in religion all gave up God all years ago. And my sister, Jen was a fanatic Sydney Swans barracker. Fan I mean, like fanatic. She even wrote a memoir my my lifelong love affair with the Sydney Swans since the first game in that when she was four years old, right? So even they had her in a South Melbourne, a Sydney Guernsey on in the bed in the hospital, and they were singing the Sydney Swans song. I'm sure Jan preferred that to my silly old Buddhist mantras, you know. So I was whispering <laughs> mantras in Jan's ear, and it was very funny actually. So I mean, it, it sort of because. I think it's, I see this with people with animals. People adore their animals. And if, even if they're not Buddhist, people love the Buddhist ideas that there's something you can do. People feel like hopeless. But if even you can say a mantra for your cat or say a mantra in the ear's cat's ear or even say mantras after the cat has died, somehow people feel there's something you'd be useful, you know. So, I mean, I, it, yeah, I mean, my mother died since I was a Buddhist. And that was, again, clearly, clearly, it because if you really, yeah, you have a view in your head, and if you're trying to apply it experientially, it has to have a change. It has to determine the way you live, you know, clearly, and it has to have an effect. So I have found, yes, definitely, and and not just about in terms of death, but loss, you know, Lo I mean, just losing things or not having things or things changing. It can be very traumatic for things to change if we're not practicing, recognizing this is the reality of life. You can't hold on to, you can't guarantee things won't change, you know. I mean, so much, I think so much suffering in our lives is because we try to resist change, like live in denial of it. And, but you can't, it's like it's inevitable, it's inexorable. You, it's just the reality of life. It's evident. It's not religion, it's practical, you know, it's evident, isn't it? So, yeah, mm -hmm. for sure, it helped me a lot. Of course it does. And what advice would you say that Buddhism offers? to those who, to support others that are grieving. Oh, okay, you mentioned yeah. the mantras. What, yeah, what right, all that stuff. All that's example. I mean, well, it's interesting because, what I mean, one of my jobs is editing books, and one of the books I've edited the last few years is by my teacher, Lama Zopa, and it's actually, it's called How to Face Death Without Fear, and it's like a handbook, really. It's like hundreds of different practices that one would choose as a Buddhist to do in the weeks and months before, the weeks before, the days before, the hours before, at the time the breath stops, the three days after, and then when the mind leaves the body. There's a whole kind of, it's a chronology, you know, because there's this view in Buddhism of what happens when. So there's, well, I mean, in terms of dealing with grief, I think the main way to suffer, the main way we suffer is related to the Buddhist idea about attachment. It's a very, it's a simple word, but it's a profound state of mind. A Buddha's really effectively saying we, the main way we suffer is because of attachment. What, what, and what that means is it's multifaceted. Um, it's pr primordial. We've all got it. The, the main energy of attachment is dissatisfaction. Then because you're dissatisfied, you hanker after something. Uh, you, you feel like you're missing something. So then what do you, the first level of what you hanker after is the external world. People, things, houses, you know, sex, drugs, rock and roll, whatever. So then, of course, attachment has this other job of, because it's coming from emotional hunger, we're, I'm missing something. So then we hanker after this thing and then attachment causes it to be more beautiful than it really is. So then you learn, to, then you cling to it and possess it and fear of losing it. So of course, relationships, the most powerful. I mean, one of my darling sisters, another darling sister, there are seven of us, six of us and a brother, <laughs> my fourth sister, she got married when she was 19 had seven babies and now she's got about 27 grandchildren and several the next the next generation and her husband died recently and she won't mind me saying but she said it was the worst pain she had ever experienced i mean they've been together since they're 19 you know so i i think of that so she has her own way of seeing the world but my advice, I mean, and that is clearly because you have this life and it's, it's normal human behavior. And then suddenly that person, there's this gate, this terrible hole there, you know. And I suppose, so attachment, yeah, you can't help it because it's so, especially you have close relationships. So it's recognizing that that is the source of the pain. It's like a double-edged sword. If you have these close relationships, part of it is you can't bear the thought of losing them, but inevitably you know that you will. So you've got to learn to make the most of the relationship knowing it will end. I mean, what we tend to do is make the most of a relationship, but live in denial of an end. And that's just 
It's painful. It's just too much painful. If we can learn to re to know the reality is that even that baby could die, then it's it's very sobering. It it doesn't mean you get depressed. The fear, I think, comes from the denial of change. If we can face the reality of change, then we can make the most. I mean, I said to this woman, she said, how can I live moment by moment? I said, don't worry about that. I said, just learn to know that your husband will die. Don't say, oh, he won't die. He will die. And then at the conclusion from that isn't fear. The conclusion is, well, I mustn't waste what I've got. And then if you wake up in the morning and he's still there, all warm and toasty, you've got a bonus and you make them, so you make the most of it because it's impermanent. You don't, if you just live in fear of not of losing it, it's too frantic. But if you know it'll change at some point, then you don't want to waste it. So you make it much more useful. And so that's the, that's the analysis of it. And so, of course, when you've got the grief, the best thing to do is just, you know, heal your heart and um, and also eventually know, I suppose, when people who've had in relationships all those years, especially close relationships. Anyway, never mind. That's an old habit discussion. I just think, anyway, anyway, I've said a few things. I don't do know. Think, if that's all. I had a question. Yeah. Do, do you think the religion sort of takes the easy way out here? Because, you know, like with attach, <laughs> with, with when yeah. people, when people die and, you know, yeah. because of that attachment, it's almost like they say, no, it's all good. You guys will be together in this next life. So don't, oh, don't stress yeah. about no, that. I I mean, and that's okay what to do, you know. I mean, you can argue with that and say that's not true or you can argue with any view if you like. Mm -hmm. But you either think you fall into a black hole and there's nothing there or you think you go to heaven with God or you think you get reincarnated. We've got to decide. We've got to work out yeah. what our hypothesis is and work with it. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, I mean, it's interesting. It's like if my, you know, my mother was a Catholic, let's say the way of helping your Catholic mum, let's say, you know, would be at the time of death because, because attachment, it can be useful. It could be it could be useful. If attachment is terrified of letting go at the time of death, and you've got your Catholic mum, then you can talk to her, Mummy, God loves you. Look forward to going to heaven. So that can help a die more in a more peaceful way, which can be advantageous. So it can be useful. Yeah. Yeah. It's you a know, coping so, mechanism, is it? Is it all of these it is things a coping, are coping many mechanisms? Of, these are coping yeah. mechanisms. of course they are. If we've got a coping mm. mechanism, nothing wrong. Yeah. As for reality, we're going to find out or not, you know, so that's up to us. But it can yeah, be sensible. Well, because one of the functions of attachment is you're holding on to something, whereas another function is to look forward to something. Well, get your mum to look forward to God, then she can relax and die more peacefully, and that can be helpful for her. Hmm. Don't say. Hmm. It's up to what works for somebody. Yeah. You know. Rabina, I think yeah. a lot of people would maybe attach the concept of karma to Buddhism. Yeah. How does the concept of karma relate to death and the afterlife in Buddhism, sorry, Buddhism teachings? What it I so said the, the the idea of karma, like I said it before, but I mean I sort of said it it's probably said a simple way that we can't hear it. It's basically the idea of karma really is that is that okay. I think it look at how we tend to feel. I'm not sure. Have a look. We might say that we are we've got philosophical materialism as our view of the world. We don't believe quote unquote in karma. We don't believe quote unquote in lie in God or anything. And that means you just think you're the body and whatever. So that's your viewpoint. So then you think when we think what am I and where do I come from? I think if we articulated it, we'd say, well, my mother and father created me, wouldn't we? And then you know, and look what happens when you get upset. How dare that happen to me? I don't deserve it. I didn't ask to get born. It's not my fault. So when we're suffering, I think when we have that view, there's a very strong feeling of being this innocent victim who got plonked on this planet by somebody else. Now, I'm not trying to be controversial, but that's also the Christian teaching that God decided to make you and put you here. Well, your mother and father decide to make you, and then they sort of blame you. So, I mean, I feel we have a view already. This ego's view is very strong sense of it's not my fault. I didn't ask to get born. I don't know why things are happening. I don't know where happiness comes from. I don't know where suffering comes from. Life is just good luck and bad luck. I think that's how we often live our lives. So the Buddha's view is completely opposite to that. So is the Christian one. The Buddhist view would say that my consciousness my mind is not physical it's not the brain doesn't come from mummy daddy and at the time of conception when my mummy and daddy came together the egg and sperm came together that my consciousness from before entered into that egg and sperm very specifically due to karma of mine We've got a strong history with those two people karma the way to put karma is it's this natural the buddha would say it's a natural law 
that runs the universe. Like botany is a natural law that runs gardens. No one's there pressing the button and making botany work. And, and that's what natural law is. We understand that. Well, this is the Buddha's view that karma is not made by Buddha. He's not running it. He's not a creator. There's no creator in Buddhism. There's therefore no punishment and reward because there's no punisher and no rewarder. But we hear karma in, in like that, like, you know, but actually it's just this natural law such that whatever you think and do and say produces the person you become, not just now, but in the future. Quite literally, that's the view of karma. So given that my consciousness will continue, given that I want happiness and don't want suffering and to whatever degree, then I need to cause it. So if I want a garden in 10 years, we know perfectly well you don't sit there, twiddle your thumbs and hope someone will give you a garden. You've got to grow the bloody thing. You've got to know the causes of a garden and you work slowly and you know the law of gardening and you get a garden. No surprise. Well, the Buddha says karma's like that. It's no surprise. If you want a happy life, where you're going to be born as no killing, no stealing, not lying, people liking you, having money in the bank, forget about nirvana, then you better cause it, baby, by being not killing, not stealing, not lying, being generous, being loving, being compassionate. That the, the result of virtue or good ethics is that it produces you as a happy person and happy circumstances. It's kind of subtle how it all works. It's all there in the literature. And if you don't want to be, I mean, you want to be, you know, we don't think we want to be miserable. So therefore, if you don't want to be miserable, don't kill, don't steal, don't lie don't program your mind with that kind of rubbish because that'll just produce more suffering for you but i think the biggest thing here is we know when it comes to music or carpentry that you are the person who creates the carpenter you know that you've got to learn the theories of carpentry and you must apply them every day and it's logical you'll turn yourself into a carpenter but we don't think that when it comes to happiness and suffering we think it's my mother my father the outside world we feel we're an innocent victim it's kind of weird in a way so buddha's basically saying we we can produce the person we want to become it's a very modern simple way of putting the law of karma and it's a natural thing it's not punishment it's not reward it's kind of intense i think if we think about it it's kind of logical it's not religious it's it's, it's psychological reminds okay. me of stoicism a bit like in that you can only control what you can control and um you know external factors are beyond your control a lot of the time no i know that's true there's a lot of there's a lot of similarities isn't there a lot mm. of similarity in those mm. types of views i agree with that absolutely mm. yes but basically the idea is in buddhism that we are in charge we're the boss yeah Sure, we can't control things, so you learn to deal with that. But we are the one who has to, if you're you're in charge, if you want to become a carpenter, you have better create the cause, baby. You can't just sit there and then blame the tools and say it's not my fault. You have got to do the work. You produce the carpenter. That's the iron the idea you're trying to get to. So if you want to be happy, sweetie pie, you'd better learn to call the causes of it. What's that? Well, don't harm others. Not because of moralistic view, because you don't want to program your mind with garbage, is the real point. Mm. You understand? That's the idea. So it's like taking responsibility, being accountable, and then it lessens the victim feeling. It lessens ego, you know, as you grow up, you come, you become accountable, you become more mature. Uh, my feeling is, does that make sense, Mark? It does. Rabini, you mentioned reincarnation before. Yeah. So for yeah. someone that has lost, whether it be a partner or or a child, yeah. and they have that yeah, attach yeah. the attachment that you referred to, how yeah. does the Buddhist teachings um, view life after death or and how would that help someone that is as attached to that well, person i mean it very well might not because you know i mean the idea <laughs> of heaven is that you go to heaven and you're going to meet your beloved again and they talk about even you you know it'll be the same form and everything whatever but the buddhist idea is that this is the view of karma that the person we are now is is like an intricate result of a whole series of actions. And I mean, you're not going to end. There's no essential Rabinaness here. Rabinaness is this package, which is the result of various causes. So my beloved husband, whom I adored in this life called Fred, let's say, and he dies. There's no essential Fred that I'm going to meet again. I mean, he could be in next life. He could end up being the, you know, the son of my next door neighbor. You understand? I remember this. Uh, there's a funny, there's a wonderful story in the sutras. This hilarious one, Shari Putra, one of Buddha's disciples, who said to be kind of clairvoyant, you know, which is part of the deal. As you progress spiritually, you have this ability to see the past and future, so on. Blah blah blah. Whatever. So there he was. He went past his house and he saw this man sitting, nursing his baby, kicking the dog, and eating some fish. And Sariputra said, what a joke samsara is, that there he is nursing his enemy, 
while he kicks his kicks his father and eats his mother. So somehow he could see that the fish was the reincarnation, or maybe of his daddy, because he liked fishing in the pond next door. So he got born as a fish. The dog, because it was it was his mum from the past life, because she was really attached to that place. And the baby is the reincarnation of his uh, enemy next door, whom he killed. So what a fast samsara is. So you can't guarantee you're going to meet your, your beloved in the same form. It could be, end up being your enemy. I mean, so it's just not... like, yeah. So it's just like in the past, like, you know, it, uh, in theory, I've had past relationships and. In and... this life, precisely. That's yeah, right. That's just, so... The person you adored one life and, and then six months later, you hate the sight of them. Yeah. I'm not, I'm not, I'm not concerned true. about my past relationship because I'm here now in this relationship. And well, there, I see. No, there will, you go. That will carry on. Yeah. That's right. That's right. But I mean, oh. they talk I mean, anyway. Karma's, I mean, it's dealt with it. It's come well before Buddha, too. Came these genius Indians before the Buddha, you know. Um, these the, the system that Buddha came out of, they already they kind of anyway. So it's 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 a view that's been completely existent for like five four thousand years. And just because for us in the modern, you know, white world, European, Christian, Jewish world, but in I mean, Asians, Indians, Africans, as we all know, there's all these other cultures and white European world. Go back to the Greeks, it's about it. We know nothing about anybody else. But I think it's interesting since the Dalai Lama's been around and there's so much more now of the Buddhist philosophy and stuff that's published. And he has so many discussions with scientists and people. I think the Western world is now beginning to appreciate this extraordinary wisdom that's existed mm. for coming from India, you know, mm. which is good because we're so arrogant in the modern yeah. world. We think we know everything. Not in America, Dalai, surely not. The Dalai Lama said was these amazing Indians more than 3,000 years ago who were the ones who began the investigation into the nature of self. Well, we probably thought it was Freud 100 years ago, you know. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> anyway, so, Rubina, so, Rubina, just summing up, uh, which, which might be really difficult to surmise as in you know, a short little paragraph, but if you were to say... What are some key things from our conversation today or even your learnings over your time in, in Buddhism that mm -hmm. can help some of our listeners either preparing for the loss of a loved one and then post yeah. the loss of a loved one and the ones that are, I guess, right in the midst of, of grief. I understand. But what about facing our own loss? What about facing our own death? That too. That one? Yeah. Okay. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. Um... So if we tackle that one first, what, what about, okay. um, so facing our own death? Yeah, okay. Okay, I think, you know, the whole idea, the, the general teaching in Buddhism, which sounds so simple, is this concept of impermanence. And it's hardly rocket science. It's evident to anybody with half a brain that everything is constantly changing. It's so evident, you know. So what, so what we've got, so taking that simple evident fact, it's not religion, and then looking at how that causes us pain. And that's because we're attached, holding on, don't want to lose something. I always remember, I always quote this, and not because I'm, I'm not trying to be mean to her, but I find it such a powerful example. I remember I read an interview years ago with Nicole Kidman when she was still with Tom Cruise. And I love the woman. I'm not trying to be critical. And she said at the end of the interview, we will be together until we are 80. And that's really powerful. So what's happening there is this intellectually we know you can't guarantee that we know it but because their relationship was so delicious meaning everything was beautiful which is marvelous they were in love they had children they had a life everything was beautiful so we all know that when everything is going well because we instinctively can't bear the thought of its changing, we then grasp at it as un. We grasp at it as if we say, "Now I found happiness. Finally, I found the right relationship. Finally, I found the right job." We're looking for happiness. We want happiness, and then when we get the happy thing, it's instinctively unbearable to think we won't have it. So then we grasp at it and then live in denial of the reality that it could or would or will change. So facing this reality slowly, slowly, it doesn't make you. Pressed, it makes you value life a thousand times more and become less fearful. That's my advice. It takes time. It's very subtle in the mind, but it's primordial, you know. Then you're more skillful in your life. And then when things do change, you don't, your heart doesn't get ripped out. Mm -hmm. People think if you think, oh, well, 
Tom could leave me at any time, then you'd sort of think, well, why bother being happy? No, because he could die or leave you at any time, you make the most of your relationship. That's you why it has most. value because it's that's why it has value. It's not Whereas unlimited. No, that's right. And because it has value, that's exactly right. Mm. Then you then like and you and you don't want to waste your time having fights and ridiculous because you realize things can change at any time. So you make the most of it. This takes time. It's kind of quite a, a subtle process that has to occur. But it's primordial and it it covers everything in our lives because we have this enormous fear of losing happy things, basically, you know, or craving for happy things. And then when we get them, fearing losing it, you know. Mm. We can see. So facing the reality of it, then you're more skillful. And when things do change, you don't have a mental breakdown. Your heart breaks, you're sad, but you, you can continue. You know, you haven't, mm -hmm. heart isn't out. Do you understand? Yeah, absolutely. And your so your final piece of advice for someone that has, or right now is in the midst of grief and they have had their heart ripped out and they've, they've lost their loved one what would your advice from a Buddhist teachings perspective be? I think just be human, have friends, cry, weep, be sad, have friends to love you, you know, to help you heal. But then know in the back of your mind that um, things change. And sometimes that makes people very sad, you know, uh, that somehow you should give it, that feel sad that you might forget your husband. Do you understand? So you almost feel like it's not good to stop suffering. But just know, just to take, I mean, the simplest advice is just take care of yourself. Ha be sad. Cry. It's okay, you know. But keep moving, keep moving, keep moving, and know that everything will be fine. I don't want to say it. There's no point in saying anymore. It's like theory, you know. Mm -hmm. And have good friends to love you and nurture you. That's so important. It's great advice. Both both pieces of advice, Rabina, actually, the... Um, making the most of your time with your loved ones, knowing that there will be a time that, that they're gone, but that's then also exactly. post that knowing that it'll be okay as well. And that's, living exactly, life and that's exactly right. Yeah. And knowing that you will die as well. So I'd say the other piece of advice, you know, we know that beings die every day. You see the ants and the humans and the dogs, you read about the wars. Then it gets a bit close to home when your beloved dies. But the real teaching I would suggest is then this will happen to me. And that'll give a wake-up call to help us realize that we are all impermanent and that I will die as well. So then don't waste my life. Don't waste my life. Make the most of it. That's the point. I think that's the a wonderful way to wrap up our chat, Rubina. Cool. So thank cool. thank you very much for joining us today. Thank you for giving us your perspective from your Buddhist okay. teachings. I think it's okay. been invaluable for cool. us and also our listeners. So thank oh, you, thank you again I'm, for joining us. Oh, I'm so happy and happy to be here. And you're doing a great job, both of you. Are. You're you're gorgeous. You. So keep moving, okay? <laughs> It's wonderful. Thanks for, Thanks for <laughs> Can I sing a tiny prayer in Tibetan? A tiny prayer. Absolutely. We we would love that. It's like, Hell yeah. yeah. Okay. It's about it's like just it's just make it's sort of like make compassion grow and grow in the hearts of all. It's like very short. I've got I've got allergies. I'm sniffing here. Hang on, I have to blow my nose. <laughs> Lucky you're not okay. in Brisbane. Brisbane. Yeah. <laughs> Get out of Brisbane. <laughs> <laughs> on hang on. Yeah, you're right. Okay. Jang chub sem cho grin po che ma ke pa nam ke gyu chig ke pa nyam pa me pa yang gong ne gong du pelva sho. I actually read that you were trained as a classical singer in London. Oh, my, mommy, my mother taught me singing, yeah. <laughs> I went to London initially to study singing, became a hippie instead. I can hear it. That's so good. Thank you. That was beautiful. Okay, darling. Thank you. Thank you, Rebecca. So nice to meet you. Wonderful. Thank Bye. Thank you. Bye. <laughs> you. So, Ryan, that was Rubina from New York City via Melbourne. <laughs> via London, via, via everywhere. everywhere. <laughs> and that was like drinking from a fire hose. <laughs> yeah. That was it's like um, Buddhism teachings of her. Yeah. 30 oh, 40 plus years in um yeah half an hour yeah 30 minutes man i this there was so much value there but i need to like go back and listen to it again and just really like rubina talks fast she like in the intro she was saying like she acknowledges she talks fast like actually literally three times faster than everybody else 
Uh, but yeah, but also like the the stuff she was cramming in there was like, man, I just need a minute to to think this through <laughs> and digest it. I know um, there were there were moments in that conversation where I was trying to digest it, but at the same time realizing that I needed to ask her another question to keep the yeah, conversation you gotta, moving. You got to segue somehow. Yeah. <laughs> What an amazing oh. lady. What an amazing lady. I mean, oh. to have that, a different upbringing as a Catholic, and then as she admitted to being a complete radical in so many different things, mm. trying to almost find her way and then landing on on Buddhism as a, a way to live. And then you know, at, at 30, I think she said, and has been living that way since. Man, and, and happy birthday to Rubina for tomorrow. But by the time this comes out, she would have already had her birthday. Um, 79 she is. And like, she's so, so sharp, so switched on. Like I think about like grandparents of mine, you know, like 80 or whatever. Nowhere near like that. I no, know. I don't know too many 79-year-olds that would be able to jump on a Zoom meeting and be all over it. <laughs> Yeah. yeah, and just run rings around you intellectually, <laughs> and um, yeah, incredible man, absolutely rock star. I really like some of the Buddhist teachings that she briefly um, discussed on the on the podcast and how to deal with yeah. grief. I think it'd be really helpful to people. I think the the thing that stuck with me was the realizing. I mean, it, it goes without saying. I mean, it's obvious, isn't it, that we're all going to die but then being comfortable with that fact and making the most of your life because of that realization. Mm -hmm. I think yep. that was a, a key takeout for me. Yeah. And stoicism is this, there's a lot of parallels between what she was saying in stoicism as well. Cause stoicism uh, also teaches you to like meditate on your own mortality a lot of the time and, and think about those kind of things. Uh, like Marcus Aurelius and Seneca always used to write about that, that, you know, you could just lose everything today. So make the most of it. Uh, but yeah, man, Buddhism, it's, it's very interesting in that whole notion of attachment. And it's the, the, the issue of attachment is what creates all the headaches and suffering for us. And, but man, that's so much harder to put into practice to not be attached to things when programmatically, you know, we, we find happiness in attachment to things and, but but that's our problem and we need to stop doing that. And but I can't don't know how to do that because I'm mm. dumb. <laughs> no, well, I guess that's what Buddhists do every day is just yeah. meditate and uh meditate on those teachings, I guess, that this is how they should that we should all live. And then I guess someone that's not practicing Buddhism, it's really hard to grasp that because we are so attached to things mm -hmm. and people i feel like i've had a little taste of it it's, it's so dumb but a little taste of it lately and like you know when i when you drive i always have to have a podcast or music on it's just like default uh to keep me you know busy and occupied or whatnot but lately i've been really enjoying just having nothing on and just driving and like i think previously the concept of not having it on seems boring but in reality, like I'm realizing that when I'm just driving, it's actually like up to me if I'm bored or not. And and I can just be happy to sit there and just enjoy everything else. And I just wonder, like that's like a terrible example, but like Buddhism is kind of like that on a bigger, more complicated, more practiced scale, I feel. It's really up to you, like if you're bored or not, or if you're content or not, or if you're happy or not. Uh, mm. easy and, to and it's the same with grit, I guess. It's, it's up to you how you handle that and manage that yeah um, le leading up to and also post yeah it seems it seems like it's this this is really a good tool leading up to dying like if you know like if, if you have someone here or now or you're, you're still alive uh you know buddhism is, is a great tool in the toolkit it seemed to me could be wrong that if you if you just lost somebody and you're hearing this podcast now that's a little bit harder of a tool to use because it's sort of like, well, <laughs> you know, they're reincarnated. They're, they're going to be off to their next, their next appointment. Uh, and here you are. So uh, you shouldn't have been so attached in the first place. Yeah, it's too, too late. Uh, yeah. <laughs> no, <laughs> yeah. Uh, so I don't, yeah, I don't know how to reconcile that to, to balance that, but uh, I'm sure, I'm sure there is a way. 
Yeah, I think that what I took from that with our last question to Rabina was that if if you're leading up to that or or even just living in the moment and being happy and the non-attachment and then post that, I think when I asked that question, um, it was sort of angled at, okay, well, if someone hasn't yeah. lived that kind of life with the appreciation and be, being happy in the moment, um, what do they do now? Um, yeah. Sort of what you've just asked. And I think what Rabina was saying was just, just be human, be sad, cry, yeah. have people around you, but know that it will be okay. Yeah. And and everything is supposed to change. Yeah. Which doesn't, a lot of the time doesn't, it, I mean, it doesn't make it easier, but it is what it is. Yeah. Another stoic saying. <laughs> yeah. Great episode, mate. Great guest. Thank you for introducing us to Rubina. I'm sure oh, that yeah. our listeners would have got something out of that chat TAP mm. discussion. Um and, and go go follow her on Instagram too. I do, and uh, she does like little reels and stories of little bits of. She just drop the knowledge on there too, like on you know one again, minute reels. Amazing for a seventy nine year old to be on yeah, Instagram right? dropping dropping reels. It's amazing. So, I know, but I, we, I love it. Yeah, whenever I see it, I'm like, yeah. We'll uh, tag her in uh, upon this release, of course. And uh, mate, looking forward to the next chat tap guest. Hard one to follow, but. Uh, um, <laughs> I'll, uh, I think uh, equally. I think we'll 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 manage to. Uh, oh, weird! You are trying to chop it. Let me say that again. Um, I'm right, looking forward to the next chat tap guest uh, taking it from a completely different angle. I'm sure, but really cool to have a Buddhist perspective on yeah. grief. Man, I loved it. Thanks for having. Me. Thank you, man. And, and me. Talk to you soon. See you, mate. Bye.